For the past couple of weeks, we've been hearing various parables from our Lord teaching about the kingdom of heaven. So we've heard about references to seeds being sown of the wheat and the weeds. And now we have a series of short parables about a treasure buried in a field, a pearl of great price, the large catch of fish, and the head of a household. There are so many analogies that it can be seem overwhelming and try and it seems difficult perhaps to understand what our Lord is trying to get at. Each one seems to tell a different story or make a different point. And so why this rapid fire of parables? What's the kind of cohesive message that our Lord is trying to teach? But I think our Lord is trying to explain to us the nature of the kingdom of heaven, a spiritual reality that in some sense, in some ways, defies our under- ability to totally understand. And so each of these parables highlights a, a particular point of the kingdom, a particular aspect that perhaps would not be able to be explained in one easy parable. So by taking a lesson from each and placing them in a grander context, perhaps we can have a greater understanding of the kingdom of heaven. So first, we have the treasure hidden in the field. And this shows perhaps the hidden nature of the kingdom of heaven. When we hear the word kingdom, we may think of castles, kings and queens, knights, and a particular territory associated with it. And then, of course, all the people living in it. In some ways, this is true of the church. We have the clergy and the laity organized into governing structures with parishes and church buildings. And then, of course, all those who participate in the life of the church. But this, is just, but this is just one side, the more manifest, visible side. The deeper reality is that the existence of the kingdom is as that of a baptized faithful who, through the sacrament, are spiritually incorporated into one cohesive unity. That is a more profound unity that is ever possible that of a, perhaps then of a nation or family, or any other social bond that we may experience here on this earth. It is a reality that unites us with all the baptized, living and deceased, into one kingdom. It also means that within the heart of the Christian, each individual Christian, there exists the reality of the totality of the kingdom of heaven through a spiritual union with God an intimacy that is cultivated through prayer and reflection. Then there's the kingdom of heaven as the pearl of great price, which shows the great value of this kingdom that we are part of. And of course, this perhaps may speak to our riches of the richness of the arts, the richness of our, the history of the church, the richness of the architecture, the patrimony, the many things that we experience in the life of the church. But even more than perhaps these more earthly experiences, these riches speak to the great riches of the relationship we have with our Lord. It illustrates that ultimately our relationship with the Lord, our unity with him, our experience with him is beyond all the physical you know, relation, uh, riches, the physical things, the tangible, more tangible things we live and experience in this life. And ultimately, are subservient to that reality that we are all one family who serve one another and that our true treasure is the merits that we build in the treasury of heaven. The Christian must rightly order then their affections and their priorities to maintain possession of this kingdom in their heart and express it. Then the kingdom of heaven is like a net in the catch of fish. This, I think, illustrates in a good, uh, nice way uh, the, the people of the kingdom, specifically, and the great diversity of the people that make up it, this kingdom. All who belong to the church by baptism share in the same love and unity in the mercy of God. But it is also, as, as we are one, but we are also many parts of the one, right? We can think of, again, like when we use the analogy of the body, we have the whole body, it's a cohesive whole, but then we have the individual parts, the hands, the fingers, the feet, the individual cells. And so 
unlike cells, we all have our own free will and we can choose how we express and how we perhaps interact with our faith. Some ways we, some people have different or particular devotions or different ways of expressing the faith and are on various points in their journey and discipleship. Some are just beginning, some start in the RCIA. Some have been Christian or Catholic for a while and they've experienced much of the fruit of the going to the mass and participating in the life of the church. And others perhaps have over many years developed a deep, deep, profound relationship with the Lord. And of course, in this variety of individuals are also varieties of different ways, like as I said before, expressions of the faith. You know, there are different ways in which we can do that. And this all illustrates the richness of the diverse ways of the kingdom. And it falls to the fishermen, in this, in this way, the apostles and their successors in unity with the Pope, who's the successor of Peter, and who inherit, inherit Christ's authority that he gave to the apostles to help sort this diversity, to help direct it towards a, to maintain the unity of the faith. Because obviously you can't have too many uh, diverse viewpoints, otherwise you start losing the cohesion, right? The, the alt underlying unity. And so they provide that unity. And so this catch of fish illustrates that we have to balance the two, balance our individual expressions with the greater expression of the faith community as a whole, not just in the parish, but in our diocese and throughout the world. And of course, those things that we have to cast aside that perhaps do not fit in with that unity, that falls often to the bishops to make those kind of determinations and decisions as the ones who are put forward and put place to safeguard the deposit of the faith. After all these parables, then, Jesus teaches one final lesson, that the kingdom of God is both ancient and new. God's will is immutable. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't decide certain things are one way and then not another. Perhaps some things are emphasized more or perhaps are permitted because of our sinful nature. But ultimately, God's final will for us does not change. And so we have the truths of the faith that remain with us throughout the centuries. Yet at the same time, those ancient truths can be expressed in perhaps different ways, a diversity of expression that allows for that ultimate underlying truth to remain positive and relevant and, po and impactful in each generation. In some, then, the kingdom of heaven is the reality of the presence of God, Jesus Christ, both, both in a hidden way, in an inmost part of ourselves, and also as a reality that we live out in the church. It is beyond price and deserves our full devotion, and, as ne and if necessary, comes to the exclu exclusion of other things. And it is perfect. That is, it is a divine institution united with Christ without any stain and made up of many individuals who make up the, that kingdom living in diversity, yet united in one true expression of the faith under the care of the bishops. It is a, both at once new and old, having the dignity and stability of a 2,000 year foundation in Christ with the spirit living in guiding it while maintaining its vigor and relevance in every age. In this way, this tension means the kingdom remains in, large, in a certain way a mystery to us. But that it is also one that our Lord equips us through his wisdom, through our relationship and deeper reflection on it, that he sheds the light of his wisdom upon us in the hearts of all those who believe that we may come to a deeper understanding of the church and the faith, and that we will one day profoundly experience and united with all of our brothers and sisters in heaven and to see just how great and how wonderful that kingdom is in the presence of God forever.